reflect on uh, some things for a few minutes, and then I hope that we can get into uh, uh, discussion of uh, uh, questions that might arise from that. Uh, as Josh mentioned, I'm an uh, intellectual and cultural uh, historian by uh, uh, training, and I am uh, came to technology uh, fairly early, uh, digital technologies at any rate, in the mid-1970s, uh, more or less by accident, uh, having uh, uh, the accident of a good friend becoming, uh, in the uh, lame duck Ford administration, uh, the uh, Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. And he being the kind of quirky guy, uh, asking me to come and, and uh, uh, shadow him uh, much of the time to reflect on uh, what it was like when a, uh, a uh, relatively reflective university president becomes a, a head of a uh, organization as large as uh, uh, health, education, and welfare uh, was at that, that point. Uh, uh, and so I spent uh, uh, a year there. And among the things that I saw was uh, very early word processing uh, technology, uh, huge consoles, so you said, in the middle of that uh, uh, had uh, uh, store 60 pages of text. And, uh, and, uh, uh, but I thought that was an interesting uh, machine. And, uh, began working with one uh, when I came back to Columbia. Uh, well, actually, I have a right story. You convinced your wife to let you buy one for right. more than <laughs> car costs today. Uh, right. Well, that was, uh, uh, I haven't quite heard the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, and slowly began to reflect on, on uh, that not so much as a, uh, a means of getting some work done, uh, but as something that would uh, have in due course significant influence on the way our culture works. Uh, uh, as a historian of education, one of the uh, things that uh, has, uh, from the very early on, most interested me is, is the interplay between communications technologies and educational practices. Uh, and long before uh, thinking at all about digital technologies, uh, uh, spent a lot of time uh, thinking about how uh, the alphabetic uh, uh, writing uh, affected Greek culture and the introduction of print uh, affected uh, European culture in the uh, 16th century and uh, the process by which uh, medieval educational practices, which were mainly apprenticeship and a weird kind of schooling in which you had to teach people to read and write with uh, uh, very little access to uh, uh, texts and, and uh, resources that uh, actually uh, presented reading and writing to the people to whom you were teaching, uh, began to readapt themselves uh, as uh, printed texts became uh, a fairly common uh, phenomenon. And one of the uh, things that, that uh, struck me then and still strikes me is the slowness with which that readaptation took place. Uh, uh, print became a, a fairly widespread commonplace uh, uh, by around 1500, and uh, the more uh, speculatively inclined began to describe educational systems more or less like we know them uh, uh, in the early 1500s, uh, but it uh, took until uh, well into the 1800s, in some ways the 19, uh, uh, early 1900s, to fully realize those systems. Uh, so a reformer uh, in uh, the early 1600s, like Comenius, uh, really had uh, speculatively uh, depicted uh, a 20th century uh, educational system and how it worked and, and, and how it would stack itself and, and what the pedagogy would be like. Uh, but it took uh, a great deal of social historical development to uh, uh, actually put those visions into place. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, I'm uh, more and more struck by uh, as we try to figure out uh, the best uses of, of digital technologies in our uh, environments uh, 
that perhaps uh, we too are caught in this uh, uh, tension between uh, potentialities and uh, the problems of making those potentialities into full-fledged uh, actualities. Uh, and that's been, in a way, uh, the uh, leitmotif of, of uh, my experience uh, over uh, 25, uh, 30 years of uh, thinking about and working with uh, digital technologies in different uh, educational settings. And um, what I kind of want to stress is the importance of, of simultaneously looking in both directions. How can we be very, very practical and mobilize the uh, wherewithal and the resources uh, of the world, uh, the, the pedagogical world as it is given to us, uh, at the same time uh, that we uh, don't uh, close down our sense of, of what the potential horizon is and uh, remind ourselves continually that perhaps uh, there are uh, uh, wave after wave of further innovation that, that might take place uh, uh, historically as this whole process uh, moves forward. Uh, Early in my career, I, I, I wrote a, a fairly long essay towards a place for study in the world of instruction. Uh, and uh, I, as an educational theorist, uh, deeply believe uh, that uh, study, uh, which in its root meaning means to be passionate about something, uh, uh, to be independent in one's engagement with it, uh, uh, to be furious about it, uh, 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 and to uh, try to take hold of it for oneself. Uh, uh, that study is part of our historical educational tradition that in the 20th century got pressed into the background, uh, and that we have created a world of instruction, uh, which uh, as educators we have all experienced in our own education and we're deeply engaged in, uh, in, in working with school systems and, and uh, uh, the way they work and the way they're structured. Um, uh, and I, I think that uh, the, there's an immense amount of potential educative energy locked up in the students' capacity for study, which our current arrangements in education do a very poor job in mobilizing, in releasing, in channeling, in making full use of. Uh, uh, we, we, the world of instruction is, it's great failing as the board student. Uh, the student who, uh, as a young child, is a passionate learner excited about this or that possibility, speculative, full of dreams and ideas, uh, who then uh, becomes uh, uh, disengaged and uh, loses a sense of, of uh, his or her own real potentiality and uh, finds uh, uh, himself or herself uh, uh, in a kind of, of lockstep of routine and expectation and projection upon uh, uh, the, the growing consciousness of what it is uh, supposed to do uh, rather than what it uh, feels passionate and studious about. Uh, and really, the basic thing that's attracted me to the digital technologies uh, and the reason why uh, I think uh, you see it reflected in uh, the uh, way they have spread, where, where people have been self-directed learners in, in appropriating the, techno uh, the digital technologies for themselves. Uh, uh, everybody who has uh, uh, engaged an operating system or a programming language or, or a, uh, 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 a set of office software uh, has had to uh, come to grips with their 
own powers of self-education to diagnose what the hell's going on with this machine when it, it, it behaves in ways that we don't uh, expect it. And I think the, the whole system of the digital world uh, is something that is highly responsive to the powers of control of the user uh, rather than uh, the uh, powers of apprehension of uh, the uh, uh, viewer or uh, uh, the listener. Uh, uh, it's a much more active uh, technology in its inherent characteristics. Um, and I think the challenge to me has been to find ways to uh, mobilize that potentiality of the digital uh, uh, technology as the infrastructure, the historical infrastructure, the cultural infrastructure of a world of study, of a world in which students can engage their own interests, uh, can follow uh, the path of uh, most passionate uh, self-development uh, uh, that they can uh, feel that they can get a hold of. Uh, and yet, in seeking to do that, uh, it's, uh, for me, uh, been uh, 25, 30 years of, of repeated frustration, of, of seeing the world of instruction uh, continually uh, project itself upon uh, the potentialities of uh, much of the implementation in the educational experience of, uh, of the technology. Uh, the sense uh, that the school is uh, a, a relatively unchangeable massive institution given its routines uh, uh, that uh, must be observed. Uh, uh, I like about the film Ghostbusters uh, was the uh, uh, the huge Mr. Marshmallow uh, uh, sitting on top of uh, uh, a building in Brooklyn, uh, which, uh, uh, or at least I imagined it was in Brooklyn, and I imagined it was 110 Livingston Street, Livingston Street, when uh, 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 the uh, uh, Board of Education was still there, and I said, man, that's a perfect symbol for our uh, educational systems. Uh, uh, and you can shoot anything at it and, and it'll just absorb it and, and nothing will happen. Uh, 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 and that's in a sense the, the frustration of uh, uh, the, uh, a reformer's consciousness trying to use the digital uh, uh, technologies in education uh, 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 to uh, engender a world of study. Uh, but at the same time, there's, uh, in a sense, a, a kind of uh, uh, wonderful sequence of historical surprises in, in that technology. Uh, and I will get eventually to uh, 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 the most recent of them, uh, which I think is, is uh, sort of the, the concept of the digital commons, uh, uh, the uh, non-market, generation through open source software and open source uh, 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 content uh, of uh, uh, what uh, uh, is a very, very uh, generative uh, uh, form of uh, innovation and development in a very peculiar uh, relationship, I think, to uh, uh, more traditionally uh, capital-driven uh, forms of innovation and development. Uh, but in order to, to get there, I, I want to uh, say a little bit about certain ideas that seem to me uh, fairly early on in engaging the question of how do you implement a fully developed digitally based educational system uh, in uh, the late 20th century, now early 21st century. Uh, 
I've had the luxury of doing that through grant finance stuff where I haven't had too much, uh, uh, haven't had to look at the bottom line uh, too much. I say too much because I've had enough of it up to here. Uh, and I'm not doing it anymore. Uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, the, and I'd say that the biggest project uh, that, uh, where I met Josh, uh, uh, that I've done in the schools, or, or one of the two biggest projects, uh, was a uh, very well financed effort in the Dalton School in the early 1990s uh, to uh, create a uh, digital curriculum for the Dalton School, or, or at least a substantial part of it. Uh, and that had, uh, in its turn, grown out of a, uh, a long and sad courtship uh, that uh, I and a number of colleagues uh, uh, had between our, the Institute for Learning Technologies at Columbia and, and IBM, uh, where we developed uh, with the hope of, of major funding in a, in a uh, uh, pilot project that was going to involve a public school in each of the five boroughs, uh, or the uh, four largest boroughs, and the Dalton School, uh, called the Cumulative Curriculum Project. And it represented uh, the most serious thinking that done over a number of, of, of years, of what the, the long-term historical consequences of uh, the digital technologies would be on the structure of the school curriculum. Uh, and we called it the cumulative curriculum uh, in order to contrast what I'm sure you uh, know in a little bit about the, the kinds of programs that you uh, develop uh, are uh, very aware of, uh, uh, namely the sequential curriculum. That root concept in, in modern uh, school curriculum development of the scope and sequence uh, uh, is simply fundamental uh, to the way we organize knowledge uh, and present it to children in uh, the historically developed print-based set of educational institutions. Uh, and it always seemed to me it makes perfect sense when you have to uh, encapsulate uh, the information to uh, be presented in a textbook, uh, which even though it's gotten oversized and too heavy, uh, and we've gotten to the point where kids now are rolling their backpacks up, uh, on uh, 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 there is a serious limit on what can go into a textbook, and so it has to be broken into subjects, uh, has to have a scope, and uh, that scope uh, uh, means that uh, you almost have to commit yourself to a sequential presentation of the knowledge over time. Um, and this early, early on, uh, Thinking about uh, first uh, uh, storage media such as CD-ROMs, um, and uh, intuiting while using a, a very kludgy early email, uh, uh, the idea that networks are going to become a, a very powerful way of distributing an immense amounts of, 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 of content. Uh, the sequential curriculum does not really make a great deal of sense in a world in which uh, all our knowledge resources are digitized and are at command at any time, at any place, uh, deliverable in uh, an instant or two uh, uh, to anyone uh, relatively readable and usable way. Uh, 
Uh, so the, in a sense, in the same way uh, that the right to copy is being broken down uh, in, by the technology of the digital world in which copying becomes a trivial, trivial cost uh, given the infrastructure. Possessing the right to copy may be legally meaningful, but it's no longer technologically, no longer in a in a uh, historical materialist sense, a a reality. Uh, it's it's simply a, a vestige of uh, uh, a former uh, uh, set of means of production. Uh, the scope and sequence is also a vestigial uh, uh, reality. Unavoidable in a curriculum that has to present itself in print. But fundamentally meaningless in a curriculum that is available uh, ubiquitously in digital form. Now we can argue whether in uh, early levels of uh, the acquisition of certain fundamental skills, reading, uh, math, and the like. Uh, uh, there is not only an extrinsic scope and sequence imposed by having to package things in, in, inside borders, uh, but there may be a logical scope and sequence uh, uh, that is embedded somewhere is between whatever kind of wiring gets induced in our, in our brains, uh, or is there uh, uh, in some determinate sense. Uh, and uh, the logic of uh, that particular skill, uh, I'm, I'm willing to uh, grant uh, that there is probably a, an inherent scope and sequence uh, for uh, many skills uh, where first things come first. Uh, but much of our curriculum, starting in the middle elementary grades and going on through uh, the rest of the process, is really an, an engagement and apprehension with the substantive resources of our culture. And increasingly, those are there for everyone at any time, at any place, in any order uh, that one may wish to uh, tap into it. Uh, uh, and we are very, very, very far uh, from organizing our uh, patterns of activity, uh, our expectations of ourselves, our teachers, our students, uh, our systems, uh, to take full advantage of that flexibility. Uh, um, and I think it will take a long, long time to get from here to there. Uh, but one of the interesting things, uh, uh, or interesting points of faith that somehow I've acquired as a cultural historian is that over time, given enough time, uh, uh, these processes will, will work themselves out. Uh, and uh, one group or another will discover ways uh, to uh, develop uh, the inherent potentialities of this cultural flexibility. Uh, now, the, it seems to me that if one uh, looks at a curriculum in a seriously analytic point of view, from the point of view of a cultural analysis, less uh, more than a psychological analysis. Uh, uh, a, a curriculum or any particular part of it uh, uh, consists of a library of resources. Uh, which we organize through scope and sequence in the sequential curriculum. Uh, There are disciplines which are ways of approaching that library. 
uh, intellectual skills that have been worked out for asking and answering questions within the library. At the elementary and secondary level, we call those disciplines subjects. Uh, higher education, we call them disciplines. Uh, but they are, uh, they are strategies of inquiry uh, and apprehension. And uh, then as educators, uh, we use assignments, many different forms of assignments that we give to students uh, that get them to use the resources of a discipline upon their library. Uh, and the fourth major component of, of uh, the educational experience, I think, is, is, is that uh, we apply to the fruits of those assignments, uh, various assessments, uh, and uh, make judgments about uh, the quality of work uh, done uh, as a result of the assignment. The assignment may be a test, it may be a paper, it may be a, a, a a lesson, uh, a recite, recitation, and so on and so forth. Uh, um, now, if one's going to look at the process of educational change as a historian, uh, you have to ask, how is the library changing? Uh, how, how are the disciplines changing? Uh, how are the assignments changing? And how are the assessments changing? Uh, and Early uh, in the mid 80s, I, I wrote an essay uh, called Into the Starting Gate. Um, uh, that there was at that point a lot of uh, hype and speculation about, uh, you know, everybody's uh, getting together, uh, parent groups buying uh, uh, Apple IIEs and, and, and early Macs for uh, their schools and getting them uh, put in the school and that's to uh, change everything. Uh, and into the starting gate, I, I, I kind of quantified uh, the information that's available uh, in uh, uh, high school textbooks uh, and, and quantified that it was then available uh, in digital form uh, uh, for use on these machines that we were putting in the schools. And uh, you get, uh, at least then, got this humongous amount uh, if you just take the digital value of, of, of a textbook with a few illustrations and so forth, uh, pointing to a second layer of, of uh, uh, resources. Uh, it would work out to many, many, many gigabytes of, of uh, stuff there printed in, in our printed resources, to a relatively few uh, gigabytes at that point. Uh, uh, and that seemed to me to be a, a quantitative comparison uh, between uh, the library available in, in physical printed form and the library available in digital form. We're one to do the same analysis now. Uh, uh, the, the average child uh, with a uh, networked computer, uh, uh, relative to the sum of uh, a school library, most variations within the school, uh, will have a much larger quantity of information in the digital library than they will in, in the, the printed library. Um, by end of the starting gate, I simply argued that you're not going to have a true test uh, uh, of what might be accomplished in a digitally-based uh, educational environment versus a printed-based uh, digital environment until you had enough of a digital library uh, to uh, uh, have a comparable uh, uh, base. Um, I think what's happening, uh, what just took off, and, and uh, uh, another theme that I, I uh, uh, would advise if you want to uh, think about where things are going, uh, you look at, is some of the uh, literature that has begun to take shape on uh, dynamics of emergent phenomena uh, rather than 
linear uh, developmental phenomenon. Uh, the, the digital library uh, began to become emergent in the sense of passing from a slow acceleration uh, over the uh, last couple of decades of the 20th century to a very, very rapid acceleration in the uh, uh, early 21st century. Uh, and we'll probably continue to do that. I think we're launched uh, uh, despite the uh, uh, copyright laws that are going on. Uh, we're launched to where virtually everything uh, is getting uh, digitized at a pace that, that uh, it's very hard for us to uh, uh, even track. Uh, uh, and that library that we work with uh, is uh, irrevocably becoming digital. Uh, and the strange part about it is that, uh, and I think uh, because the material base for holding most cultural content as a form of tangible property is being undercut. Uh, uh, the success of Hollywood and Disney and, and others in, in uh, extending copyright notwithstanding, an immense portion of that digital library is going to end up in the public domain. Uh, it is, uh, I think, the, and it's doing that very, very rapidly. Uh, I teach a complex, uh, uh, highly content-based uh, course, uh, with a content uh, with a colleague, goes on all year, uh, uh, 20th century social thought and, and uh, communication theory. And uh, a year ago, I was looking at digital encyclopedias, uh, uh, the uh, Rutledge Encyclopedia of Philosophy and Digital Form, which probably libraries give you free access to uh, all kinds of paying, highly costly stuff. Uh, uh, was by far the best resource at that point uh, for just basic background material. Uh, looked at Wikipedia uh, a year and a half ago in some detail and thought, yeah, that's uh, interesting but not really very useful. Uh, a couple of months ago, I did the same kind of assessment and uh, I completely reversed my judgments. Uh, the Wikipedia was uh, by far the best uh, uh, such resource and the language uh, uh, was ecstatic uh, and no longer uh, really competitive. Uh, uh, the basic assignment, uh, as the library changes, uh, we hear great complaints that uh, writing papers has become too easy. Uh, people just copy this and the other thing from uh, the web. Uh, uh, so assignments, when the Library changes, uh, disciplines change, uh, in passing, uh, the disciplines at their higher level now are almost entirely uh, committed to a, uh, uh, a work routine that's all digitally based rather than uh, uh, it may end up uh, for tenure purposes, uh, another lag uh, in printed form, but, but everything that gets to that is, is uh, in digital form. Assignments uh, are, I think, going to start fairly rapidly changing. Uh, to give you an instance, um, I think the, one of the major problems uh, with Wikipedia and other uh, user-produced uh, public domain, copyleft, uh, uh, substantive resources is to uh, get a full commitment to realizing the quality potentials that uh, need to be done. Uh, in higher education, as I know you all know from uh, your own experience, my own experience, the, the, the basic assignment is to write a research paper. 
That's what one learns to do in college. Uh, that's what one does through graduate school. Uh, how many research papers of one or another quality or one or another subject did each of you write uh, in the course of your uh, education? What happens to those research papers? Most of them end up perhaps filed away in your closet someplace. Uh, 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 faculty members uh, uh, really hate to read them all and uh, do a comment on them. Uh, and uh, they take on a very routine, uh, they are not necessarily uh, the world of study, although at their best they become that, but uh, all too often uh, something that you do because you have to do it. You pick the easiest topic or the topic that you think the professor will like and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, I predict that five years from now, uh, such research papers uh, will be an option if a student thinks that they really are going to have something of novel, publishable quality uh, that they can do if they want. Uh, uh, but the main responsibility in higher education of students would be to participate uh, in a kind of collective uh, commitment to, am I causing that? Uh, 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 Welcome to Double. Uh, I, I guess they're going to explode something else. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the basic assignment is going to become uh, to participate under some uh, supervision uh, in the production process of a ver whole variety of peer-produced intellectual resources, uh, open uh, for free to anyone uh, in every subject, uh, that presents the state of knowledge in this field, that field, uh, this professional area, that professional area. Uh, and that that's going to uh, shift uh, the long-term, uh, it's going to make all sorts of things uh, that now are produced for profit uh, to be uh, available uh, for, uh, for free at uh, quality levels uh, that I think are going to uh, prove to be surprisingly high. Uh, uh, the, the open uh, peer-reviewed uh, participatory production of serious materials, I think, is one of these things that nobody really expected out of, uh, in uh, thinking about how the digital infrastructure will work, uh, that is uh, going to have historical consequences uh, for our idea of authorship and the ownership of ideas, uh, quite analogous to the consequences that print had uh, in making uh, knowledge and uh, creative uh, realization of uh, literary and intellectual work, uh, something that uh, one had a property interest in. Um, you compare in the Middle Ages uh, the line between originating an idea and copying an idea. Uh, who, who was the author of that idea? It was a very murky line. Uh, 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 and it really took well into the 18th century uh, for the kind of idea of authorship that we take for granted uh, to emerge as a cultural and historical uh, idea and actuality. Uh, and yet we see that idea of authorship uh, in some ways beginning to rapidly break down. And I'm sure there are going to be good consequences of that and bad consequences of that. Uh, but one of the consequences of it, I think, is that the uh, stock of knowledge uh, that is available to anyone at any place at any time 
is going to uh, take on a uh, and 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 at no cost other than the uh, uh, access to the infrastructure of, of uh, our, our resource is going to uh, uh, take hold very 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 quickly. Now that to me begins to make the infrastructure required for a cumulative curriculum uh, uh, into a historical reality. Uh, we're no longer committed to uh, the readers and textbooks uh, and all that goes with them uh, as economic necessities uh, to perpetuate the uh, material basis for uh, so scope and sequence based education. The interesting part of it, uh, in the sense is that the infrastructure for an alternative is coming into place not through the educational structures uh, but in the cultural surroundings of those educational structures. Uh, and this is going to put a lot of pressure on those educational structures. Uh, uh, pressure that may actually begin to have effects on Mr. Marshall. Uh, in a relatively uh, short uh, historical period of time. And as I say, that, that may be for both better and for worse. Uh, the the fourth area, library discipline and assignment, suggesting are getting digitized and while everybody's uh, in a sense looking at the early years of the educational system as a point of innovation um, one may argue that at least in that large domain of the educational system that in which content is primary over skills, basic skills, uh, uh, the changes are coming down uh, the scope and sequence uh, rather than going up. Uh, uh, that I think one's going to see a lot of changes in the basic assignment of higher education. And the fourth area that is very, very important, and one that uh, I think wireless generation has rightly identified as uh, a area to really uh, focus on, uh, uh, is that of assessment. Uh, but what is assessment in the context of a cumulative curriculum? where everybody has access to the whole shebang all at once. Uh, and there may be multiple valid paths through all of that. And the power to prescribe this necessary path or that necessary path may start breaking down. Uh, that seems to me to be the, the uh, historically interesting question that we are on the threshold of uh, beginning to have thrust upon us. Um, and how do you create uh, assessment tools uh, for a world of study? Uh, one fundamental difference between a world of study is a shift in who your basic client is, I think. Because in a world of study, 
uh, the, the real client is the student. They have a great deal of control. Uh, they have a great deal of power. One of the things, one of the great frustrations we had in trying to innovate in uh, educational institutions with digital technologies is getting across the idea that the technology really belongs to the student. Uh, um, that it isn't a teaching technology, but it's a technology of study. Uh, this is increasingly something that one sees uh, uh, inescapably in higher education. Uh, and I think it's, it's going to push further and further down. Uh, uh, students have options that they didn't have in the past. And therefore, they become the clients of the assessment. The assessment needs to become something that the student can use to inform their powers of self-control within a curriculum uh, that is cumulative in the sense that each one is describing a path that is their own path through the sum total of the assets of the culture. And it will become increasingly hard to say that this path and that path, uh, one is inherently good, the other is inherently uh, bad. This is the challenge. Uh, now, uh, probably uh, I'm getting kind of old, and uh, uh, I no longer have to be fully responsible for uh, uh, answering uh, to these challenges. Uh, uh, but as the wireless generation, uh, uh, if you really deeply take uh, 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 to heart what that uh, phrase means, uh, uh, that the wireless generation, it is wireless, uh, it doesn't even depend on these things uh, uh, for uh, getting access uh, to that sum total of the intellectual assets of a culture. Uh, wherever you are, whenever you want, whoever you are, given the fundamental tools, you can chart your path. And that's all going to be available to everyone for free. You can't even control who gets access to what by uh, asking who can pay for it. Uh, how are you going to give form, give coherence, allow people to uh, uh, say, I am getting closer to where I want to go and where I want to go has value, has meaning, is worthwhile to myself and to others. Uh, the, if all the assets are open to everyone, all of the time, for free, this is going to put an immense premium on the power to dynamically assess what people are doing, or to inform, uh, to be a little more precise, to inform the efforts of each person to dynamically assess what they are doing with those assets relative to their purposes. And that's uh, uh, where I think uh, the long-term creative challenge of making a uh, really humane and, and, and uh, powerful edu world of education uh, out of uh, the fundamental resources of, of the technologies that we're dealing with. So, uh, now, how you translate that into a business plan uh, uh, is uh, I, I have the luxury of not having to uh, really work too hard uh, on, although I think that uh, there probably are ways to do it. Uh, and I think that it's something that one has to uh, draw energy out of the existing system and find ways of turning that into the concrete creation of uh, an uh, alternative uh, uh, system.
one that, that is uh, going to be uh, in very, very uh, extensive ways, uh, not just a uh, injecting of new technologies into that uh, system, system uh, that we take for granted, uh, but one that is uh, uh, over historical time profoundly transformed, as transformed as uh, the modern school system uh, looks like in comparison to a uh, very free weaving familial uh, based apprenticeship system of the Middle Ages. So that's, that's the, the historical vision uh, that I, I uh, still started out with this and, and I still think is very important and, and uh, one that uh, uh, I'd love to talk uh, about with you. Sorry to go on for so long. What time is it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So should we do 15, 20 minutes of M&A? Yeah. I have lots of questions. So, um, I'll start with you. Okay. Uh, I have a whole bunch of questions that are sort of interrelated, I guess. But um, a number of the things that we, I think, face uh, day in, day out in our work with schools that are um, uh, some of the artifacts going way back, but a lot of the artifacts have sort of recent history in, in the school system's efforts to um, to change around the assignment and assessment in particular are uh, standards, which um, have kind of arisen with a, a dual meaning where the two meanings don't have, um, are often directly at odds with respect to the, um, the type of questions that you talked about, one being the standard in the sense of um, a measure or level of quality that um, that the system should be um, yielding for children's individual experience and, and across the system. And then the other, this sense of a convention or um, commonality across the experience of, of the kids. Um, and standards have become, I think, more and more important in a way that has sort of surprised me in the last um, few years, rather than less and less so, and by that I mean standards in the latter sense that I'm talking so I'm not I'm curious what your thoughts are about where that's going and how, um, what, what can alter that. And then sort of related to that is um, uh, the dynamic between assessment and accountability, where um, assessment inherently isn't, isn't itself necessarily about um, the accountability of the this, this system to various other stakeholders, but um, most of the innovation in assessment in our industry right now is being driven by the accountability movement, which I think um, tends to cut against a lot of the innovations that you're talking about. So um, I'd love to hear your reaction to all that. And, and just lastly, the, uh, if, if, the, if, the, uh, if the basic assignment in higher ed were to, in the quite near future, become, as you said, um, not the research paper, but a uh, kind of participation in the creation of the whole, or you know, stewardship or part of the Wikipedia or something else, what does that mean for the assignment in K-12? Um, accountability, I, I, I think, is one of those things that's going to be under a huge amount of pressure. Uh, um, that the the justification of the sequential educational system um, is in various utilitarian extrinsic consequences. Um, and the the driving force behind um, a lot of what seems to be emergent in our culture, I think is committed to, strangely enough, uh, participation in uh, uh, things that people judge worthwhile, not primarily for their consequences, but because they, uh, they enjoy them. Uh, uh, the, the open content, open source movements, uh, in, a, in an earlier historical sense, uh, uh, 
about um, scientific commitments, uh, or the commitment to being a scientist. Uh, 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 and a lot of uh, the urge to knowledge. Uh, uh, while it often has utilitarian consequences, I think is, is uh, uh, why do people write from Wikipedia? Uh, they don't, uh, uh, what, one of the, the most curious features of it, I think, is the anonymity of, of uh, contributors. Uh, it's hard to, hard to find. Uh, the whole ethos of being a user is that uh, you don't use your own name. Uh, uh, but people, uh, nevertheless, throw, uh, or, or a significant number of people uh, throw a lot of energy into it. Um, the, some of the most dynamic, uh, again, some of them are, are uh, highly elevated and others are, are uh, uh, pop culture in that most elevated sense. Uh, uh, but things that people do because they like it, uh, uh, they're engaged in it, uh, it, it has value to them. Uh, 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 Facebook, MySpace. Uh, uh, um, so what do we mean by accountability? Uh, that it, it has his, uh, economic and social, political consequences that we approve of, uh, which is, I think is what uh, the kind of accountability, or uh, I like it. Uh, it engages me. Uh, it's meaningful to me. And what's surprising about things like Wikipedia is that the the uh, I like it or or, or Linux and, and uh, Apache. Uh, uh, there are ways of structuring uh, those commitments that are. Um, culturally very productive um, and and so well we talk a lot uh, at least in, in schools of education we talk a lot about democratic education and democratic culture now, uh, but what does that mean to me in part it may mean uh, a culture that people participate in because they find it as an end in itself worthwhile to them. Uh, and I would argue that if these things are historically transformative, we have to be open to the idea that, that the meaning of accountability will fundamentally change. Uh, uh, and that it is a, Accountability is accountable to you and me as self-governing individual human beings uh, living in, in uh, uh, communion with other human beings. Uh, uh, we find it worthwhile. Uh, in a very fundamental sense, it's worth my while uh, to do it. Um, that I suspect will be a, uh, a again, uh, a Hegelian among other things. And, and uh, one uh, in thinking about history has to be very open to its ironies and, and, and uh, the possibilities of it ending up in places that look like uh, they are highly unlikely uh, at any particular time. Uh, um, we live at a time of rampant selfishness uh, in, a, in a very crass sense. Uh, I, I was going to uh, uh, reflect on the difference in the tax schedule when I was a child and now. Uh, it's one of the few historical changes that I've really witnessed in, in, in my life. Uh, we're the top rate uh, in the high, uh, high point of the Eisenhower era. Republican era uh, was 91 percent uh, for uh, income over you know, it's about two and a half million uh, uh, dollars per year. Uh, now it's uh, the top rate is uh, for Kevin jointly uh, is uh, 35 percent for income over 335 thousand or so. Um, 
uh, much less than that for iron mingling. Pardon me? And much less than that for other mingling. Right. Uh, oh, it's, it's lower all the way down, but, but, but the percentage decreases have been um, the higher up the, the level we were, the greater uh, the uh, uh, decrease. But at any rate, the public, I think, in a sense, the historical movement has been towards what I've experienced as a growing public parsimony. Yet, what I'm arguing is that uh, the uh, material structure of our culture is one in which uh, it's, it's altruistic, it's autonomous, it's uh, non-market uh, uh, features are uh, being, particularly in the educational world, strengthened. Um, and I, I expect there will be a lot of conflict over that. I don't, I, 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 I don't think there's an easy answer to uh, school systems will remain school systems for a long time. They will, they will insist on accountability in the way uh, accountability is defined. Uh, uh, there will be a, uh, a growing tension between the uh, capacity of the culture to support uh, a very different kind of, of set of activities and, and those uh, tendencies, I think. That answered a little bit of your question. But what about the assignment in K-12? So well, it's, it's um, not quite imaginable that, well, but, you know. um, I, I think in the early years, I, I imagine there won't be a great deal of change. Um, um, the, I think that we make a fetish of coverage and um, uh, attention to scope and sequence. Uh, the standards I think it's hard, hard to argue uh, against the, in a, in a frontal way, against those who say, well, we must have a uh, commonality, a common culture, or something in common, uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, be able to talk with each other, deal with issues together. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I believe that. In that, yeah, the canon's good, and I, I read the canon, um, but but the the canon is 0.1 percent of the worthwhile literature that essentially cycles through the same set of themes, and I don't think that we have to have read that 0.1 percent. Or to have studied uh, uh, American history this way or that way, or, or to study have studied American history rather than English history, or, or uh, to be Afghanistan history or whatever, uh, to uh, engage one's cultural resources or cultural resources by thinking seriously about issues of, of judgment, issues of justice, issues of, of uh, 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 meaning and value. Uh, so, I, 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 as you know, one of the programs that, that I think was very, very interesting out of the Dalton project was a thing called Archetype, which introduced uh, fifth graders to ancient history uh, by creating archaeological simulated archaeological digs of, of ancient Greece and, and uh, 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 Syria and uh, uh, the like. Um, and kids had to work in groups. And then, uh, it, it, it may be familiar to you or may not, but uh, it was extremely engaging. It, it, it pulled children into thinking as archaeologists, thinking as uh, classically historians. Uh, 
engaging the discipline, using the library. It was an assignment uh, that went on for uh, eight, 16 weeks. Uh, 